Welcome to Board Game Binge, the place where we bring you bite-sized, bingeable board game content from across the industry. I'm your host, James Staley, and in this episode, we're chatting with Arwen Kathke, host of Cardboard Time Podcast, where she interviews and chats with publishers, artists, and designers of games we play and love. You can join Arwen on her podcast journey to take her shelf from uh, shelf of shame, so I say, by downloading her podcast wherever you get your favorite podcast. Her podcast again is called Cardboard Time. Arwen, welcome to the binge. How are you doing? I'm fantastic, James. How are you? I am doing great. Uh, it was very generous of you to have us on your podcast, and um, you know, I thought that. Uh, this, I haven't had an actual podcaster on that's been exclusively podcast on our podcast yet. So for me, it was a natural fit uh, to have you come on and, and, and talk to us. Um, I want to start off by talking about um, something we talked about on our podcast. And I'm going to go to a larger screen here just so people can see it. So you're kind of off screen right now. But I'm going to hold this up so people can see it. Can you see what this is? Yes. This yes. is a Kinder Egg. And I was shocked um, that the... Um, they, it tell us a story about this in the States. Like, for me, I, I, this, was, this blew me away. So, apparently, in the States, there was an issue. And I don't quite exactly know how it boiled down. There were a number of theories about whether it was Hershey's trying to get in on Kinder's game and they were trying to influence a, a bunch of legislators or whether it was just a bunch of people trying to eliminate choking hazards. That's the official story that we got about the Kinder Eggs. Uh, but essentially, Kinder Eggs are in their normal form uh, around the rest of the world, illegal in the United States. Um, so it, it's like a big fine if you bring one in and you import it, it yeah. like random knowledge that i have through years of traveling um but yeah they finally brought the i think it's kinder joy to the states but the toy is separate <laughs> nobody wants a separate toy everybody wants the toy inside of the egg i know this means nothing to anybody about board <laughs> games this is like the farthest from board games but it does kind of talk about toys a little bit here and uh you know, I'm going to hold these up one more time because not only is there like the main Kinder Egg with the toy inside, so it's not outside. I can actually crack this open, play the toy, gorge on the chocolate, which I'm literally going to do as soon as this podcast is done because I'm a chocoholic. There's a Barbie one. You. There's a Paw Patrol one. Oh, I, I just I just love it. You know, the, the, the joy that something like this, uh, little connections can make between people. And I think that that is something that, Reminds me of, of of what you bring on your podcast is these these connections, right? Whether it be traveling to conventions and meeting with people, or or sitting down, and, you know, reviewing a game, or quite frankly, talking to people like us uh, that were guests on your your podcast. I want to know where did this all start? How did you get into the whole board game industry in the first place? So I started playing games back in 2011, and it was. It was one of those things that I played video games very heavily and I kind of wanted to branch out a little bit more and start making some more human connections. And I was introduced to a little game called Dungeon Quest, yeah. uh, which some people have heard of and some people have not. The people that have heard of it go and they look at that game at a convention and they say, yeah, I, I, I remember that. I remember my times that I died in that, that maze. <laughs> it, it's just a fun, fun time. And it really opened my eyes to what the tabletop hobby pretty much brought. Yeah. Um, you know, where you can make those connections, where you can have those fun times sitting around a table with your friends. Um, not that being online and playing a video game with somebody else from across the country is a bad thing, but really making that human connection, I think is so incredibly important. So once I got into the hobby, I started really kind of collecting a little bit more as opposed to playing yeah. and wound up with a pretty 
big what I call my shelf of shame. So how uh, big is this? Sh- how, how many games do you have? Because I've seen some of the pictures on your social media profile. It seems like you got like a crap load of games. So <laughs> how many games do you have? So it's it's this and then like a huge wall of yeah. games going that way. Um, the, the games I currently have, it's about 700 at this point. Wow. Um, you know, it's it's my main hobby. Um, a lot of them I picked up on really good sales. Uh, fortunately, some are review copies now, which is great. Uh, but the majority I, I picked up myself because I really either like the look of the gameplay or the theme. Um, yeah, so it's it's been a um, it's been a collection for sure. And then so what do you what's your day job? Like, what do you what do you do outside of board games? So I'm I'm actually a uh, senior engineer for Goodyear. I simulate processes that we have in our facilities. So basically make a virtual copy of that. So if we have to go and make changes to a process, what is that going to do to the product? Um, that's essentially my job in a nutshell. See, when I hear that and I think about some of the content that I've listened to where you get into kind of the details of a game and you get very specific right? on this is how this game works and this is what this game's trying to achieve and this is where, you know, this mechanic might kind of wear itself out or wear out as welcome and so forth. Would you say that your, you know, kind of your career has kind of helped inform kind of your approach to board games? Absolutely. I consider myself a, a really mechanically inclined person. So that's one of the things I talk about a game like uh, Praga, for example, has these very mechanical gears and dials uh, with physical stops in them. I like the 3D elements of some games, um, but also mechanically from a gameplay standpoint, I really like the nuts and bolts of the game, trying to figure out what's really driving the engine behind the game as well. So it, it's very much uh, something that's kind of an extension of my day job, if you will. And so the natural prog- progression, I would say, would be to get into game design. Like, is this something that interests you at all? Or have you kind of dabbled with at all in your in your, kind of in your recent board game history? It, it's actually funny that you mentioned that. We... Uh, Actually, when I say we, uh, my often co-host Justin Peters and myself Mm -hmm. uh, took a stab at game design back uh, in 2018, 2019. Uh, We did a board game called Thrifton, which was all about thrift shopping. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Going going and getting the best deals at the thrift shop. Yeah. Um, And... I think our favorite part of that game was this mechanic where if you didn't buy something in one week, it went down a layer of shelves. So it was cheaper the next week. And there are ways that you can manipulate where the items were. Um, I just really liked that mechanic um, that, that we came up with. I thought it was, it was pretty cool. Uh, never really took do- took off, but it was really fun to develop. And, um, you know, someday we might get back to that. But Justin's working on his own game as well right did now. Did you try so, to, like, did you look to put it on Kickstarter or GameCraft or anything like that? Or Yeah, Kickstarter is a really tough platform. Yeah. And I, I really commend the people that can do it, um, you know, because you have to have that social media presence and you have to constantly build that following. Yeah. Um, so we had shopped it to publishers and we shopped it at a, uh, speed pitching event at origins back in 2019, which was probably the most intense two hours of my life. <laughs> it was so nerve wracking. I, I look back at that and wonder how I made it through it. it but was, you survived. It you came out the other end, right? I, I did. I did. <laughs> the game didn't sell, but I, yeah. I survived personally. That actually sounds like a pretty cool idea. It's almost like a lemonade stand kind of a feel to it where you're running a business and then like anything, even if you go on like Facebook marketplace, right? You put something out, you want to get one price and you're going to slowly start, you know, bringing the price down over time until it finally, uh, uh, finally sells. That's, mm-hmm. uh, that's interesting. You're right. It is a grind, um, to build that following for, uh, for Kickstarter. 
we had a, a great interview with Brendan McCaskill. I just saw a blog actually Jamie Stagmeyer did today where he talked about that interview. And, you know, he, he kind of reinforced what, what Brendan was saying, you know, in terms of, you know, how to approach this and building the audience way in advance, um, test marketing, different concepts and so forth. So that when you hit the ground, you're basically hitting the ground running. So it was kind of cool to see people in the industry having very similar thoughts and kind of confirming what uh, each other's beliefs are on how to approach this. And certainly from, I mean, you've got some pretty massive campaigns that these guys have run. So it's kind of cool to kind of sit back in the audience and, and, and see them kind of comment on each other's content. It's a, it's a cool thing. So for the Cardboard Time podcast, you're coming up on your one year anniversary, right? You've got your, your, your one year episode is the next one, is it? It, it actually is the next one, yeah. Okay, now have you already recorded it or is it? We tried last night, um, a little bit of a spoiler, but Justin was kind of in the need of some sleep last night. So yeah. we tried, we weren't successful. Uh, Justin, who is my co-host for the first one, is coming back finally uh, for the anniversary episode. And we will probably be recording that either Saturday or Sunday. Oh, so that's cool. we're, we're, I'm looking forward to that. We've got some really cool stuff in store. Now, for people out there looking to get into podcasting, what's some advice you would offer? So I know you use, for instance, Anchor, right? You talk about Anchor FM mm -hmm. when you uh, when you do your episodes. Can you talk about a little bit about what that is and, and why you use it? Yeah, Anchor has been a fantastic platform for us. Uh, when we originally started talking about doing the podcast, one of the big things was really trying to find a host. Yeah. And everybody can hear it on my episodes. Well, you know, this commercial break comes up. I got to talk about Anchor. And what I say about it is really true. It, it's an easy to use platform. Um, they host everything. They distribute everything. So when we go out to Spotify, when we go out to Apple Podcasts, Podbreaker, um, everything, they basically do the work for us. Um, so not being really knowledgeable about podcasting at the time, I really wanted something simple. And uh, that's why we, we chose to, to go with Anchor. Um, as far as tips and tricks go, um, you know, the, the first thing is you absolutely have to be passionate about what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the amount of money that you can potentially make off of this is relatively minimal, but the amount of self-satisfaction and the community that you build out of it, I think is more than well worth it. And it's really priceless. Um, I've made connections with people from the Netherlands, people from Canada, um, <laughs> you know, people from Australia that, you know, and, and people from Cleveland in Akron, uh, that get a hold of me and say, Hey, you know, we listen to the podcast. We really like this. Why don't we meet up and why don't we get together, play some games? And I think those connections are, are so, so meaningful to me. Um, you know, you really, really have to love what you do. Yeah. It certainly is a community, right? And being able to kind of plug into that community, you know, with whatever your piece is, right? And in this case, yours is a, is a podcast, right? Somebody else might plug into a community because they love photography. If you look at like uh, Todd Patrick Quinn from uh, Imagine All the Meeples, you know, if it's somebody that's uh, a videographer, or maybe somebody who likes doing rule book edit, there's so many different ways to just plug into this passion and, and be part of kind of this whole thing. It's it's really cool and inspiring to, to see and to, and to talk to different people like you're saying. So tell us about this, this kind of shelf of shame. So you've got this kind of angle you take on your, on your episodes, right? So walk us through this. Mm -hmm. What is this all about? So one of the segments that we do on every single episode is called our, my shelf of shame. And I run down every uh, board game that I've played between the previous podcast and the current podcast. Uh, I give account of my shelf of shame, which is basically my unplayed game. So mm. anything that I haven't played, that's a resident of the shelf of shame. Eventually, I'd love to get that to zero. Um, but there's two parts to that. One is playing the games that are on there. And then the other is actually not buying more <laughs> games that I see that I really like that I think are going to be pretty awesome. 
uh, to put on the shelf of shame. So it's, it's a constant balancing act. And I think doing the podcast has really helped me kind of control that a lot because I have to be accountable uh, to the general public and basically say, yeah, this, this went up seven games last week when I was at Origins. Um, you know, and, and basically I had to tell people, yeah, yeah, I, I, uh, I had a bad week, but, um, so do you it, actually have like a, like, in, is it basically ranked in terms of the order? Like how you're going to like get to the next game? Is that how you kind of, you set it? And then a game could kind of get in front of that one or how does that work? Yeah, it's, it's pretty much whatever I can get to the table with friends at this point. Uh, at some point, we're going to do a little bit more planning and, and try to have some game nights because Twilight Imperium is up on my shelf of shame and three versions of Twilight Imperium are on there. So oh, there's, there's a lot of really heavy lifting that we have to get through. Uh, on some of these so it'll take a little bit of planning but... I, was, I was laughing in your last episode when you're talking about i think it was at origins when you're saying uh you're talking about furnace and you're like ah it's not for me and you, you took a pass and then someone else had the game and you're like okay maybe i'll maybe i'll get the game <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> that was uh back with the, the rock manor guys i can't yeah. remember if it was sam or michael but um, one of them basically said, ask me what my game of the show was. And then I asked them and they said, oh, Furnace. I'm like, oh man, I gotta <laughs> buy that. <sighs> I often have that on, on, on this podcast. I'll, um, we'll interview somebody and I tell myself, I'm not going to, I'm not going to back any more games. I, I've, I've backed too many. I got to stop. And then I'll do the interview and afterwards, I'm like, damn you. And they're like, what? And I'm like, I'm going to back your game. <laughs> because you get it's into it, right? To. Yeah, when you start getting it's into the details of it and the passion. Behind, and especially when the story, right? When you hear the story behind how it came together. Perfect example. Last uh, episode we had with um, uh, Lucas, 17-year-old who launched uh, uh, Crisis on uh, Cardea. So inspirational. You know, a 17-year-old putting themselves out there never used Facebook, understood, you know, I got to learn how to use Facebook because, you know, basically Kickstarter, most ads for Kickstarter is going to come from Facebook. Went out, you know, aligned himself with a team to help him, you know, fill in the areas that he didn't know and try to figure it out. Put a big social piece to it where, you know, he's taking, uh, for every game that's backed, he'll, he'll match out with another game that goes to a local school, uh, off air. He's like, Oh, I forgot to talk about the QR codes. He's got a QR code. He's going to put on the card so somebody can scan it and learn about that support worker career and maybe, you know, investigate it. Maybe if that's a career they want to get into like, just wow. when you hear stories like that. So as soon as we're done, I'm like, you know, buddy, I'm going to back this game. Like I can't not back this. Number one, your game sounds awesome. Is right in my mm -hmm. wheelhouse. It's a light deck builder, but just that story, right? That story for me said, you know what? I, I, I got to get behind this because, you know, I believe in this kid. And I, th I think, uh, you know, if more people do that, I think this really helps the community, right? It don't just back games because you want to play a game. And I think it's important, back games you want to play. But mm -hmm. in some cases, I don't think it's a bad idea to throw a dollar someone's way if they've got, you know, a, a passion project they've done and you believe in them and in, as an individual. And I often do that. I'll back a game or I'll put some money behind a game just because I believe in that person, not necessarily because I want to actually get a copy of that game. So just kind of want to throw that out there. Mm -hmm. um, what do you look for in a game? So when you're trying to find you know, a, a title that you're going to add to your shelf, right, which is already way too large, <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you look for? So probably the number one thing for me is going to be theme. Uh, if if I can find a good, unique theme, it's going to draw me in at least to take a, a gander at something and, and take a look at something. Um, another thing is is that great story, like you mentioned. Uh, one, one of the big stories that I have here is a, a little game called Flip and Finds Diner. Um, by Gerald King, who's a mainstay in the uh, Akron playtesting development community. And he came out with it, and it was his first Kickstarter. And he says, oh, I, I just, you know, I, I really want to get this thing going. And I had to back it at that point, 
you meet people through the podcast, like you were saying, that have yeah. those stories. So a lot of my games recently have kind of come into my collection because of that. I interview people and I said, oh, this sounds right up my alley or this yeah. sounds like an amazing experience. And then third is is kind of mechanics. I'm a sucker for engine builders. <laughs> I am I don't need any more, but for whatever reason they still wind up making it in my collection. I I don't know how. They just wander into my basement. Oh, that's awesome. So you you do like a lot of um, uh, of these conventions, right? And you know, people who listen to this podcast know that I'm relatively new to the industry. Although my first game I made 20 years ago really didn't get into publishing until about three years ago, just over three and a half years ago now. Um, so you know, this was right before kind of we got into COVID. So uh, you know, I participated in Breakout Con in uh, in Toronto here in Canada, mm -hmm. um, but then missed the next two years of of you know the conventions in the states. What's something that you would say has um, has changed quite a bit that you're seeing now when you're going to these conventions? It, it's really been interesting. I started going to board game conventions back in 2017. And mm. before that, I went to my fair share of anime conventions all the way back oh, cool. to 2007. Um, so quite a while ago. Uh, one of the, the big things I've seen kind of overall change for the better has been the inclusivity of people, um, you know, and, and really trying to provide a, a supportive environment. Um, myself, I'm transgender, and I didn't know how an, a convention like Origins was going to go for me. Um, and it was really welcoming. Everybody was there with open arms, and it was a fantastic place. Uh, so really, I think even within a two year span, I've seen that kind of change uh, for the better. Um, this year, Origins was a lot smaller. And I think the number that I saw was 10,000, which was about half of yeah. what they normally do. And I found that the, and granted, I was there for a different purpose this year than I was before, but um, I, I found that everybody was way more welcoming. You formed a lot stronger bonds with the people that were uh, there to retail. Um, you know, people were excited to be back at the table. And I think that's one thing a lot of conventions try to replicate with the online conventions. So Gen Con Online uh, Origins would have tried that yeah. online last year. Uh, you cannot replicate the experience of being at a table with people and talking to them face to face. And that's what was so magical about this. There's an energy to that, right? There like is. When, you, when, you're, when you're at a table and you see somebody kind of approaching and it's like, you know, you haven't seen him in a while, right? Like, get over here, give me a hug. Yeah. Oh my God, it's so yeah. good to see you. Oh God, what, what are you doing here? You know, what are you doing tonight? Uh, and you cannot replicate that in a digital format. It is impossible, right? And digital mm -hmm. format, from what I've, I've experienced, is more you got to book meetings and it's very transactional, right? Yes. Um, yes. Has there been anything that you've seen, like, because they've made, obviously, there's been a lot of changes to accommodate, you know, COVID protocols and so forth. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you've seen that you're like, hmm, that's actually not a bad idea. We should kind of keep that maybe going forward when uh, when things kind of uh, open back up and we're, we're past all this pandemic nonsense. I I would, and, and I kind of go back and forth on this, but I would almost love to see capacity limits put in mm. uh, just so that, you know, social distancing has been kind of a good thing. I don't need to be in a packed like jam packed, super tight, um, yeah. convention hall for three days. Um, I, I think that that has really done wonders. Like I felt wonderful at origins. Um, I did go to dragon con this year down in Atlanta and it was the same thing. Like you could move, you could breathe. You weren't worried about everything just being so jam packed in um that and hand sanitizer you know the <laughs> amount of hand sanitizer that was around i think in general we probably have some habits now hopefully 
at this point that uh, you know we can kind of maintain and we'll be able to take into the future with us and really being careful with how we handle ourselves after we touch a bunch of components and game pieces yeah. uh, that are on a table, I think is is going to be one of those things I'd like to see transfer over. Shocking how cleaning your hands can uh, <laughs> be a benefit to society and that people need to have something like a pandemic to actually uh, start doing that. But hopefully uh, this whole sticking parts in your mouth you know everybody knows that one person when they're playing a, a board game night and the person's got a pen or whatever and they're kind of mm -hmm. like you know touching their face with the pen or the the meeple and it's like oh god please yeah, that's me that's <laughs> me i'm i'm terrible i chew on pens i chew on pencils um you know i i'm always thinking about touching my face and that's really something that i think i've gotten out of this is <laughs> now, I, I've also heard you talk about Tabletop Simulator a lot, and you, you've got a lot of experience using that. Um, have, in your opinion, have you have you seen Tabletop Simulator really expand in its utility in this industry? Yeah, it's, it's been great. And actually, one of the major inroads that I made as a podcaster was signing up for virtual demos on Tabletop Simulator. Uh. Um, you know, during the middle of the pandemic, what else are you going to do? Uh, and some publisher wants to go and show off their new game and they want coverage of it. They want to show off an early copy of it on Tabletop Sim. Okay, I'll pop on for a couple of hours. What else am I going to do other than be stuck in my house? Yeah. So I think that the ability for podcasters from all over the place, you don't have to be there for a in-person demo. Um, you know, the ability to kind of connect a wide variety of podcasters or media, um, you know, in this case, I, I think the ability to do that is something that uh, Tabletop Simulator has really, really enabled. And I'm very grateful for it mm -hmm. um, because I, I really do credit it for kind of giving me some inroads into the industry and, and being able to cover the things I do. No, that's cool. Yeah, I totally agree. I, and I, I look at it from the other angle, from a developer standpoint, even the iteration is much faster right mm -hmm. and um by forcing people to use tabletop simulator i think that there's a lot of people that are you know cutting it with scissors and using tape and glue and um i think it's it's made um prototyping quite frankly of games uh, that much more accessible quite frankly to people yeah. that maybe didn't have the time energy and effort to be able to cut things out manually and so forth i know a lot of people still do that and i think that's great but for those who want to kind of do a quick idea um, you can certainly do that very quickly in something like Tabletop Simulator. So what, where, where does uh, Cardboard Time go from here? What's the vision for your, for, where, where do you, what's kind of the end goal? Not the end goal, but what's the kind of the next level for you? So I, I think really the, the next year is going to be spent focusing on really the stories in the industry. So one of the mm -hmm. things that we really saw at Origins was the even large companies you think of cge aeg uh thunderworks you think of them as these big companies these big behemoths in the industry that put out all these huge titles and even those companies are made of a few people um and to be able to tell the stories of not only the um, you know design of games, but publishing uh, the artists, I really want to be able to tell more of those stories. Yeah. So I think that listeners really should uh, look forward to hearing some more of those. I think we've got some pretty good stuff lined up. Um, if you want to hear that, it's um, at anger.fm slash cardboard time uh, or basically any major podcast outlet. And then my Instagram, uh, where I take a lot of pictures, and I will continue to do so, <laughs> uh, and post some of what I've been playing, is at uh, cardboard underscore time, and my Twitter is the same handle. 
Now, if they go to cardboardtime.com, that also, I think, links to all these different, like, I know you can yes. link to Anchor FM yep. straight from there, mm-hmm. uh, your, your social media handles as well. I, I'll say the, the your photography is very good. <laughs> Thank you. I love the pictures. Some of it's mine. Some of it's mine. Some of it's my girlfriend's, actually. Got so yeah, probably yeah. the better ones are hers. <laughs> Well, Arwen, I want to thank you so much for coming on this podcast. I want to wish you all the best with your podcast. Uh, It's exciting. I love listening to it. Hopefully, we'll uh, see you do some more, maybe even live interviews or something. Maybe that could be uh, another hook for you. I am always up for that, James. And thank you so much for having me on. Uh, We'll get you back on. Thank you so much. Uh, You take care. Cheers. Awesome. You too. This has been an episode of the Board Game Binge Podcast, hosted by James Staley, produced by James Staley and Mike Bruner with original music by Nick Smith. If you would like to watch these interviews live, simply join the Facebook group Board Game Binge and you'll get access to live interviews, giveaways, and interesting board game content from across the industry. I can't wait for you to join us. See you next time.